All right, looks like we are live. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to another Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time. We do this every week, 7 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time. I am Dan, your friendly fishmonger from dansfish.com. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here with you all. Kind of a holiday thing going on here a little bit, as you can tell from the thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> hey HC, how you doing? Hey everybody, I've said hi to most people. We were hanging out before the chat, but uh, hey everybody. Hey HC, I've got a question. Did uh, did you did that guy that was trying to buy your stuff ever? Did you ever get in touch? Did that work out? Hoping that worked out okay. Been wondering about that. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it was an email entered incorrectly, so I think that was the issue there. But let's see, who have I missed? Uh, I don't think. Hey, Bob, welcome. Carbon, welcome. Michael, glad you're here. And I'm looking elegant. Yes, I know. I'm about two weeks overdue for a haircut. I, I keep trying. Like today, I was like, okay, I'm going to do a haircut today before the live stream. And then I had a choice. I could do that or I could edit a new unboxing video and get that done and I was just like yeah it's got to be the video so <laughs> so yeah but uh thanks I'm, I'm glad you like it I'm glad you like the uh the elegance <laughs> hey Thomas glad you made it um Otter Creek welcome see if I missed you I'm sorry I think I hit everybody but Let's get right into it. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope you've all had a great holiday. It's been interesting for me. I've been uh, basically watching uh, tracking, shipping tracking, like television, just trying to make sure all these packages get where they're going. Good news is all but three packages have got where they're going, and it looks like the other three will get there tomorrow, and if that's the case, I think everyone will be just fine. I'm a little bit nervous about Friday. Like, if they don't get there tomorrow, I'm a little bit nervous. Because um, the heat packs will run out tomorrow night. So, that has me wondering. But, it's funny this week. Uh, the postal system's tracking is just completely... I, I don't know. I don't know. They've got issues going on. It's, it's saying stuff got somewhere before I even dropped it off. It's saying... Like, something was delivered, and then four hours later, they got a notification it was delivered. It's saying stuff is, like, in Sheridan, Wyoming. And then, lo and behold, it's delivered. So, tracking's been weird this week. But, I think everything's going to be okay. But, it's been a little bit crazy for a, a fishmonger shipping fish. I don't know if next year, if I'll do it this close to Christmas. Um, I think everything's going to be fine, but it's just nerve-wracking. So, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, so for those that are new, or just a reminder, for those who are uh, not new, old, I don't know, um, if you have a question or a comment for me, if you make it at and start typing Dan's Fish and let it populate, select it, it'll highlight for me. I'll see it. I'll jump right to it. And uh, then you, you won't have to see me going like this for five minutes as I look for a question or a comment. It just makes for bad television. So if you make it out dance fish, that'll help make this uh, a little bit tighter of a live stream, a lot less dead air time, which is never fun, dead air time. So just Thomas Skipper who said hi at dance fish and it highlighted and I saw it. So hi at Thomas Skipper, glad you're here. Um, Bob Kaler says, Dan, thanks for the early Christmas present. You're welcome, Bob. You've supported, you've supported me long enough uh, <laughs> that I felt like I should give you a little present. So I'm glad you like that. And uh, are those not gorgeous? Like, for those that don't know uh, Bob, what Bob's talking about, check out his uh, YouTube channel. There's a video there of an unboxing. I snuck a little something extra in there. And, uh, yeah, just to say thanks to Bob for all his support for, uh, oh, maybe about a year now, I think, Bob. So... Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Don Gallagher. Wow. Blinding glare off your head. I know. I know. It's the curse of ball. Is this better? There. We'll shade it for you. How's that? 
<laughs> I should wear like a, I should wear a cap, like a fisherman's skull cap, just to keep the glare down. Yeah, this is my, this is my, it's two things. It's my defense mechanism. If someone comes too close, I'm just like, back off, right? Um, and it's also, you know, back in the day, it was great for dating, you know, just signal like a, like a lizard. <laughs> I'm kidding. I was married before I went bald. Thank goodness. Tampa Tom, no bike today. Been raining all day. Still raining. Really? We'll have to wait. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that because it's awesome to be able to get out there, but glad you're here. Raining makes you here. Uh, Bob Kaler says, thanks, Dan, for the early Christmas present. Oh, I already read that. Oh, it did twice. Oh, you populated it. I see what you did there, Bob. Thomas Skipper, I will be ordering off of you after the new year. I want the killifish and some, some peacock gudgeons. Cool. Well, they're all doing really well, so uh, yeah, order away. I've got another clutch of peacock gudgeons today. It's like every pipe in there is full of eggs. It's crazy. So, <laughs> 54 Punchy says that's what hats, what they make hats for, Dan. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Meat Man, hey, what's up, Pork Slinger? Glad you're here. Glad you are here. I'm part of the Blades Club. Did you mean Bald Club? If so, I feel you, brother. Otter Creek, challenging nanofish to breed in a 10-gallon. I think any kerosene or cyprinid, pretty much. Um, but let me think a little beyond that. Challenging. I think in general, most kerosene, so those are tetras and pencil fish and things like that, um, and cyprinids, so those are like barbs and danios and rasboras, are actually fairly challenging simply because their babies are so small that getting them through their first couple weeks is a challenge. So I'm going to go with that, I think. Let's see here. What is a fish that I have just... There's a dream fish I have that I will one day try to breed, and a 10-gallon would be great for it. It's um, Kerasidium rakavi. Let me show you guys this. I've had them before. So the Kerasidium are the, the, the hummingbird tetras, right? The darter tetras from South America. Right? We're all kind of familiar with them. But the Rakavi, let me see if I can find a good picture of them. Um, it's not showing well, but they have pretty bright orange colored fins. You kind of see it here. You see a little bit of orange, but in person, in a fish that's happy, they look exactly like this, except for these fins are bright, bright orange. Um, not sure why no one has a picture of them looking good. Anyway, in person, they're bright, bright orange. I never bred that fish. I tried. I had three males and one female. They're from Uruguay, so they're more temperate than, um, than they are tropical. And I think they might need like a cooling period, like native fish. Uh, North American native fish, anyway. So I'm going to go with that. Get yourself some Kerasidium rakavi and... Uh, See if you can breed them before I can. How's that, Otter Creek? <laughs> but honestly, I think almost any of the little tetras and stuff can be challenging. <clears throat> and I know that you can, you know, have a heavily planted tank and every now and then a couple will appear. But I'm talking about, like, spawning a large clutch and raising, you know, the vast majority of that large clutch and really doing it like that. That's what I'm thinking. Um... See, so another one that I haven't bred, not that I don't think I could, I just didn't put a lot of effort into it, would probably be like a pencil fish. I think pencil fish are pretty cool. You know one that isn't difficult to breed, but is super fun to breed is the splash tetra. Those things are awesome. If you put those in a 10 gallon aquarium, I bet they'd breed for you. And it's, it's really fun to breed them because of their interesting behavior. So I'm gonna go with that. Kerasidium rakavi or Splash Tetra? Otter Creek, that's my thought. Um, you need some Get Gills hats. Yeah, maybe I should do that. I could do that on Teespring pretty easily, I think. Bathyphilia, 
Any breeding action with the Apocalyptes spolachin? Yeah, a ton. In fact, I have a bunch of fry growing up right now. Um, they're laying eggs constantly. The eggs are huge for that size fish. They're big eggs. And so I'm raising them with a group of Aphiosimian australi right now. The australi babies like to stay on the bottom, and the spolachin babies like to be up at the top. So it, it, it works really well. So, yep, they're doing great. In fact, all of the killifish that I got are breeding, uh, are doing great. So, yep, got a little batch of those raising up right now, just for funsies. I, I like them a ton. Oh, hang on, my phone's going nuts, so I'm going to, I forgot to turn it off. Hang on, guys, sorry. I don't want it to be beeping the whole time. All right, I'm back. Um, Tampa Tom, do they make battery-powered heaters? Ooh, I don't know. If not, why? Where are they at? I've never seen one, Tampa Tom. Does anyone know if they make battery-powered heaters? Um, my guess is if they don't is that they just take so darn much electricity that they would just drain the battery so fast. Anyone know that? I've never heard of one. I haven't specifically looked for one either, but I don't think so. Uh, you know, I think a heater would drain a battery super fast or take so much power that a battery couldn't do it. Maybe a 12-volt if you hooked it up to... I guess, Tampa, if you got desperate, you could get a converter for a 12-volt battery, and you could probably run one off that. I bet you could. So, I don't know. Uh, Wichita, I've been checking out your half beaks. I need to buy some after the holidays. I had no idea they were live bears. What is the gestation period? I don't know. Um, I'd have to look that up. Is it 60 days? Okay, that's worth looking up. I can't remember off the top of my head. Gestation for There was a time I knew it. it. Says about a month. Oh, that's Wikipedia. I don't I don't know if Wikipedia knows what's going on. Let's look at seriously fish. They tend to have um, much more reliable information, I would say. It says 3 to 6 weeks. Gestation is heavily dependent on temperature three to six weeks. So, yeah, that's what uh, Seriously Fish says. I've never kept track of it, Wichita. I kind of set up my tanks so that when babies appear, they, they just appear. So I don't keep track of it much personally. Three to six weeks, that's quite the range. Really? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um... Fish Guru Aquatics, don't splash tetras lay their eggs above the waterline? Yeah, they do. I first bred them on accident. I got a few, and I can't remember where I got them. Probably at a fish club or something. And I put them in a bare 10-gallon tank with a glass lid, and across the back of the lid was that black plastic strip, so you could cut it out to put in your heater or whatever, right? And uh, I didn't do anything. The water was probably about... Oh, two inches below the glass top and I walked by one day and I was like what and I did a double take and there were a bunch of fry in there I literally did nothing it was a bare tank with like a sponge filter because I wasn't trying to breed them at the time I was you know gonna set up some fancy thing where they had a bunch of like uh, I don't know pothos plants hanging above the water to spawn in and all that no plain old <laughs> tank just on the glass lid um, and on the black plastic that went across the top. So that's how I did it. It was super easy. But yeah, they lay their eggs outside of the water, uh, above the water line. And then the male will sit there and actually in, and splash the eggs to keep them wet and moist. So it's, it's a really interesting behavior. You have to be a little bit of care, a little bit of careful, a little bit careful because there's a lot of splash tetras in the hobby that are closely related but aren't actually splash tetras. In fact, that whole family, uh, the copellas and stuff, and, and similar looking fish have interesting behaviors um, where some will lay their eggs outside, above the water line, I mean. Um, some will lay their eggs in groups on plants and actually defend them, more or less like cichlids. From what I've read, I've never done it, and there's a lot of misinformation out there, but that's my understanding. They have some pretty advanced behavior. Some will dig out like a little pit in the gravel or the sand and, uh, and lay their eggs there. And I believe the male guards them. So 
They're an interesting species. Not a lot of kerosens have brood care, but a few do. So yes, Thomas, that is what they do. TM Aquatics, hello back. Glad you're here. Dan Gallagher, I've never heard of Splash Tetras. I love Tetras. Have a heavily planted tank with Sherpes and Black Tetras. Well, let's show you a Splash Tetra. They're worth it. They're pretty cool. So, um, here's what they look like. They're not in a hugely ornate fish, but I think they're pretty cool looking. Let's see, is that, that's a little cloudy, that picture isn't really sharp. Let's try this one. It's a little better. Um, but the Copellas are, are a neat, I don't know, family or group of fishes, I guess. I'm not sure where something becomes an order and a class and a genus and a species and a family and a kingdom and a phylum and all that. So same family might not be accurate, but it's a neat group of fish for sure. And they're, they got along great with everything. They didn't bother anything. They weren't aggressive. They just would spawn randomly on their own without any special care at all. And no strange foods or anything, flakes, pellets, frozen, stuff like that. So yeah. Hey, Jadrin, Jadrin's here. Okay, everyone, all at once. I'm a fish nerd. A fish nerd. <laughs> Jadrin, that was really funny. <laughs> For those who haven't seen it, go check out Jadrin's channel and uh, and check out the rap he did. It was pretty... I like the one about... I forget how it went exactly, but I don't care. I'm ruining the carpet everywhere or something. Like, I have 200 tanks in every room, and now you're just going to destroy the carpet or something like that. I can't remember, but that was hilarious. Don Gallagher. Wow, those are cool looking things. Yeah, they are a cool fish. They're unique. And they're not super common, but they're not super rare either. They're, they're occasionally available. You can, you can find them every now and then. So, yeah. And... I don't know of another fish that does that. Um, in fresh water, <clears throat> I mean, I know that there's saltwater fish that run up on the sand and lay their eggs at high tide, but I can't think of another fish that leaps out of the water to lay its eggs. Anyone know of one, fresh or salt, besides like a sand runner? I can't, I can't think of one. I think that's kind of a unique behavior. And it's this is one thing that just makes me endlessly fascinated with our hobby is that there's so many variants and so many niches and so many adaptations to the different environments and 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 stresses and realities that fish face and they've adapted so well to them that it's just there's always something interesting and new and fun to learn or to keep or to try to breed so it never gets old for me and I haven't even touched salt water yet. I mean, I have a little bit of in, in fish stores that I worked at, but here I've, I've never at my house kept salt water, and I don't think I ever will because I don't think I'll run out of fresh water, and fresh water is so much easier. Um, Brandon Hutchins. Yes, I think I said that right. How do you breed a Colombian Tetris? So caveat, I've never bred them. I've kept them, never bred them. But here's what I would do is I would take probably a 10 gallon aquarium, maybe a five and a half gallon aquarium. I put in a sponge filter with, with limited flow. So water's flowing through it, but there's not a lot of current in the tank. I would fill the bottom with probably pretty large size pea gravel, couple layers of that so that when they spawn, the eggs will fall down into the pea gravel and the parents won't be able to get to them. And then I put a big clump of java moss in a corner. That's what I would do. Then, and this is where it gets a little different than a lot of people, um, then I would put in, oh, in a 10 gallon tank, say a dozen cherry shrimp, okay? And the filter would have to be fully mature, brought from another tank. It would be great if the gravel was fully mature and just kind of the mulm was rinsed out of it a little bit, but that the the bacteria on it was kept alive. So if you take the gravel and rinse it out with aquarium water, don't kill the bacteria, put that in there. Um, you don't have to do all this, but this is gonna help keep the, the tank stable as you raise the, the, the fry. And then, um, you know, the java moss. So I would do that, I'd leave the shrimp in there for, I don't know, maybe a week or so, make sure everything's stable. 
Then I would take a... Uh, you usually want two males to one female, but if you just have a pair, great. You know, whatever you have. But I'd probably take, oh, two or three females and six to nine males. And I would separate them. If you just have a pair, that's fine too. Again, that's fine. But separate them, feed them really well. Then after feeding them really well, say you do that when you first put the cherry shrimp in there or any kind of caridina or neocaridina shrimp. Um, then I would put them in there in the evening and into that breeding tank you set up. And the next morning, they'll probably spawn for you when the lights go on. So that's how I would attempt that fish. Now, I've never done that exact fish before, but I don't think it's going to be different, very different than uh, most of your egg scattering kerosens or other tetras. So that's what I would do. Now, another thing that I would start when I first put the cherry shrimp in there is an infusoria culture. So if you, um, so check out Mark's Aquatics. He's got some good information on starting a infusoria culture. But basically, you take a water, a bottle of water, you put in some blanched vegetables. Um, you can use pumpkin or broccoli or anything really, and. Just put a little bit of that in there and you just wait and eventually, oh, and put in water from an, an established aquarium and eventually a bunch of infusoria will bloom in there. And that's what I would use to feed the baby fish for the first couple of weeks. So I think that's the setup. Oh, by the way, once the adult uh, tetras have spawned, remove them and the baby tetras will start appearing free swimming within a few days and then you start feeding them infusoria. So that's kind of, uh, Brandon, the setup that I think I would attempt. It's one that'll be stable, so as the babies are being raised, they can stay in there for a while. Um, you're not likely to have the tank crash on you like you can if you use just a very sterile dish or something. And if, if this is a new thing to you, then I think that's one of the best setups for success. Uh, Tampa Tom. How do Siamese algae eaters breed? Do they lay eggs? They do lay eggs. And um, where's Thomas? Fish Guru Aquatics. Thomas, uh, would you tell us how yours bred? So I know that Thomas was breeding them. I'm sure they bred in this tank, but I've never, like, done anything to actually breed them and raise them and things. So Fish Guru has bred them, I believe. So if he would jump in, that would be more helpful than me. But I'm, I'm sure that... I'd be very surprised if they weren't just an egg scatterer like most of your other uh, cyprinids, but maybe maybe Thomas knows different. So yeah, all right. Um, so those are kind of my thoughts about that. Has anyone here bred the Colombian tetras? And I, I imagine it's the blue-red Colombian tetra that we're talking about, kind of a deep-bodied fish. Um, well, let me, this one, this is what I've been assuming we were talking about <laughs> um, was this guy right here. So I assume this is what we're talking about. Um, I've got one right now. <laughs> Came in with all the uh, Emperor Kerry Tetras that I got. Uh, so yeah, I've got, I've got one. <laughs> but I like the uh, blue-red Colombian Tetra. They're, they really are a pretty fish. And they're active, and in my experience, they haven't damaged anything. Some tetras can get a little nippy, but I haven't seen those be a problem whatsoever. Um, yeah. All right. So, Fancy Tail Aquatics, way late, was in the shower high out. Well, tardiness will not be tolerated. You will be punished severely to the principal's office with you. Just kidding, as always. Glad you're here, Fancy Tail. Glad you are here. I didn't say hi to 54 Punchy. Hello, 54 Punchy. Hello, Candy. Uh, glad you guys are here. Hope you're all doing well. Candy says, gone wishing. Still in Corey's stream. Thank you for the message today. <laughs> I, I, poor Corey. I send him. I hope it goes better next week. He's basically the, the live stream was a podcast today. Let's just, let's just say that. His camera is just having a hard time. But I'm sure he'll fix it. He'll fix it. It'll be bigger and better next week. Um, 
Wondering if anyone else here has bred any fish since we talked, or the projects that we talked about last time, how are those coming? Um, Bob, I'm wondering... Okay, so I was in your live stream earlier today, Bob, and it sounded like the pelvic acromas didn't end up spawning. Is that right? Or did they end up spawning? I think they didn't. I'm hoping they did, but would you let me know? And, um... Wait, wait, someone said lump my man, welcome back. Jeff Rose, lump my man, welcome back. Does that mean lumpy dogs here? Hold on, this is important. Did I miss? Jadrin, did you see lumpy dog? Is that what? Hang on. That would be awesome. I'm not seeing him. I must, I must be missing something. Oh man. <laughs> Danny says hello from Romania, the country of vampire shrimp. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's funny. Brandon says yes, that's the tetra he was talking about. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, Lumpy dog is in the house. Lumpy, are you here? Hey, man, welcome back. It's so good to see you. Where are you? I missed it. I don't see you, man. Did you put a comment down? Hang on, this is important. Lumpy Dog's an old dear friend and uh, hasn't been around for a little while, so... Lumpy Dog! Hey! <laughs> Welcome back, Jeff. So glad you're here, man. Yeah, we're at 55. We've, we've like doubled, Lumpy Dog. We're at 55. Check out them apples. <laughs> hey, Lumpy Dog, so good to see you. Glad you're here. I gotta open this lid. Oh man, I just spilled all over myself. Oh man, I missed that. So sorry, I missed your comment. And he's, he's modding right off the bat. 45 watching, only 11 likes. Smash that like button. Hey, so glad you're here. So glad you're in the house. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, that made my day. Welcome back, brother. Jeff Chambers. Hey, Dan. I got Gary Lang rainbows up to about three-fourths of an inch. Directions say to back off the heat at 1 to 1.5. Want to put them in with some plants. But will 85 degrees smoke the plants? <clears throat> really depends on your setup and your plants. Uh, plants tend to not like the heat in general. I'm not an expert on planted tanks, though. I, I, I like, I keep the hardiest, toughest, can't kill them, just, they'll take salt, they'll take copper, they'll take whatever, because I keep my tanks mostly for fish, and anytime I get new fish and I use salt, um, and I'll often use copper, too, if I need to, if there is any sign of velvet or anything like that, so I don't keep any delicate plants, so... 85 could be a little tough on them. I'm not sure. What what rainbow is it that you have to keep so hot? Is this the brackish water guys, the uh, cyanodorsalis? Um, are they the ones? Uh, Gary Lang knows his stuff, and if he told you different, stay with what he said. But in general, I keep my rainbows in the mid to upper 70s, and they all do great. Um, but there are some that need special stuff, so... Just curious which rainbow that is, Jeff. Bathyphilia. Hey, Dan's fish. I got some Limia tridens in quarantine, and the males are already mating the females. Any tips for raising the fry? This is my first breeding project. So, I think Bathyphilia, there's lots of ways to do it. But what I'm going to recommend is you get a well-established aquarium. The bigger, the better. I'm not saying it has to be huge. Like, if you have a 10-gallon, it's a 10-gallon. If you have a 75-gallon, it's a 75-gallon. What, whichever you, whatever you have. And, the, and put a bunch of plants in there. And you're looking for plants that take up a lot of space and are dense, but have enough room that fry can swim through them. So things like, for me, water sprite works great. It just floats up in there. It grows like a weed. And uh, you just get tons of places for fry to hide. The roots hang down. The fry can hang out in the roots. So you want about half the tank 
just full of plants. It could be guppy grass, it could be java moss, which I usually have under the water sprite. It could be a thick thing of hornwort. Um, it's all wrapped up in a ball, anything like that. But you want about half that tank just full of plants. And if you do that, then what you're going to be able to do is just leave the parents in there, feed them like normal, and as soon as you see babies, uh, feed a little crushed up flake over the plants every time you feed. Maybe a little baby brine shrimp if you have it. So, and you can just raise several generations in there like that. It works really well with Limias, at least in my experience. I haven't kept Tridens, but um, the, with the Nigra Fasciata and the Perugier, I can crank out a ton of babies like that, and it's no work at all on my part. So I'm not constantly having to separate and take out an, a pregnant female into a brooding tank and have her get stressed out and drop the fry prematurely or get sick or any of that stuff. Just keep them in a well-established tank that's half of the tank's choked with plants. And uh, as soon as there's fry, to start crumbling some of the flake food or some of the pellets or feeding some baby brine shrimp. Anytime you feed, just give a little bit to the babies and make it small so they can eat it. And uh, I think you're going to have a colony develop you know, in a few months, you'll have a nice colony. That's what I would say, Bathyphilia. There are many, many other ways to do it, but I think that's the easiest, and I think that that's kind of one of the more stable environments that you can set up so you have the best chance of success. So that's what I'm going to go with. Oh, Fish Guru Aquatics, you skipped my answer about the SAEs. Okay, yes, I did. Sorry. Um, it didn't highlight for me, so I skipped it, but thanks for calling my attention to it. So, yep, egg scatterers. I didn't get the fry past the first week. We have really predictable storms here in Oklahoma. I figured out if I do a water change the day of a thunderstorm that they would drop. Okay, so like quarries, like when the baromic pressure drops, they're more likely to spawn. Cool. All right. Now, one thing I've noticed with uh, SAEs is that they have a really small mouth. Like even an adult SAE for that size fish, the mouth is really small. It's just this little rasper is kind of what it is. So I would imagine that the big challenge with newborn SAEs is going to be feeding them. Um, they're probably going to need like green water, uh, infusoria, that kind of stuff. So if I was trying to raise a batch of eggs from them, I think Again, I haven't done it, but I think just from what I do know about that fish, the first thing I would try is a tank just full of green water. That's what I feel like the babies would have the best success in. So, I don't know. Maybe someone else has had a different experience. But Danny, so just a reminder to anyone that uh, wants me to reply to your question or comment, if you make it at Dan's Fish, it'll populate and highlight and I'll see it. But Danny, I see this one, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it anyway. Dan, any experience in breeding Babolti striped shrimp? Are they harder than Neos? Um, no, I've never bred that. In fact, I'm not even quite sure which that is. So let's take a look-see here, find it, and share this with everybody. Um, so what is this? So, oh, like a, tig a tiger type of shrimp? So this is just a Caridina? Oh, okay. So, nope, I haven't bred those, but I've, read, I've bred tigers and I've bred crystal red shrimp. And the way I did it was just in an aquarium, just full of plants. This was not a new tank. This is a tank that had been set up for half a year, maybe a year. Full of plants. Took out the fish. Put in the shrimp. Didn't bother them. <laughs> that's how I did it. Um, I'm not sure if that's the best way to do it, but... With a Caridina or a neo Caridina type, that's probably the first. That's how I would attempt them until I found out, oh, that didn't work, and I tweaked something. As far as their parameters, um, I'm not sure what that specific shrimp likes. I'm sorry, I just don't have any experience with that one. Um, let's see here. Does anyone else know? Anyone else breeding the Bobolti striped shrimp? It's a cool looking shrimp, by the way. I love the tiger stripes. It's a good choice. 
Jeff Chambers, he recommends to raise them at 85 or 86 until they get over an inch, then back off the heat. From Melanotania parva. Oh, okay. Well, I've bred tons of that species. Um, oh, wait. Have I? Hang on. Let me make sure I'm not... Oh, no, I haven't. I think that's the... Is that the... Oh, okay, I haven't I haven't bred that one. I'm sorry. I'm getting it confused with a different one. So yeah, whatever he says <laughs> um, I'm guessing he's saying keep them hot at first just so that you can get them to grow quickly That's my guess you might check with him on that though um, If you're not so concerned about them growing so fast, then you might not need to keep them so warm but again, I don't know that, and he is the rainbow god, so whatever he says is kind of what I would go with. I haven't read that specific species now that I looked at it. Bathyphilia, thanks for the advice. You're welcome. I hope it proves useful. <laughs> Sometimes I give the advice, and what worked for me doesn't work for everyone. And that, and that by the way, anyone listening, that's just true. Whether it's coming from me or anyone else, is that there's so many we're setting up an ecosystem and it's there's complex things happening and my water is different than yours or my maintenance schedule is different than yours or my you know light cycle is different than yours there's a million different things that could make it that what I do don't work for you so I'm just sharing what I think um, usually based off my experience if it's not off my experience I'm transparent about that because then you should go find someone that does have first-hand experience and see if it's right what I said but um, it, it, I'll, I'll tell you what works for me and what I think might work based on what I know but um, might not but I hope it does Bathyphila I hope it does I keep saying Bathyphilia Bathyphila I'll get it right one of these days Jeff Chambers got the eggs on November 3rd they hatched about a week later up to three-fourths of an inch now that's great well, that's good growth rate. So, yeah. And those are beautiful, man. Congrats on getting those and raising them. I hope you get a nice big group, breed them, and, and distribute the eggs on out there. They're, they're awesome. Fancy Teleaquatics. Oh, in fact, let's show those to people that might not know this fish. So check this out, guys. Isn't this gorgeous? Um, Lonotania parva. This is the species we're talking about. And if I remember right, these guys don't get too big. Is, is that correct, Jeff? Are these top out at about three, four inches? Um, let me know if I'm misremembering that, but that's what I remember. But that's awesome that you've got them that big. Yeah, the hard work's done as soon as they kind of get that size. Then it's just a waiting game for them to grow. Thomas Skipper, can you house the killifish and the peacock gudgeons together? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's a peacock gudgeon in with my Fundalopanchax gardener eye right now, just because he's been in that tank for a year and trying to catch him is really hard. <laughs> so he lives in there with whatever goes in there. Um, the peacock gudgeons tend to stay on the bottom, or at least towards the bottom, of the aquarium. And they work really well with Epiplates or uh, smaller Aplicylus species or other fish like that that tend to stay at the surface. Then then not only are they compatible, but they're not, they're filling different areas of the tank and it makes for a well-balanced use of space in the tank. So um, I think that with Epiplates, uh, with the species of Cayo, they would be fantastic. But they would they do fine with the garden eye, they would do fine with the Caliurums, they would do fine with any of the lamp eyes. Yeah, I think that I think that they're very compatible. The The only thing that you're going to, I think, run into is A, if they were just vastly different sized fish and so they could eat each other, but that's a no-brainer. But is if you had a big school of lamp eyes, let's say the Procatopus similis, those guys, if you had a lot of them, they're pretty quick to the food. And the peacock gudgeons are a lot slower to the food. So you could get yourself in a situation where you have a swarm of fast fish that just eat all the food up real quick before the peacock gudgeons could get any. But you'd have to have a lot of them, and that's not most killifish. So I think you would be just fine. 
Naked Reefer. Hey, Dave. <laughs> hey, Naked Reefer. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Still one of the best usernames ever. And uh, <laughs> I get the joke. I remember. <laughs> That's funny. Otter Creek Aquatics. Do you think you will have any juvenile corridors available soon? I have a whole bunch right now. I just haven't listed them. So um, I have another spawn of corridors in Neus Albino um, that are just under an inch, three quarters of an inch to an inch-ish, maybe a little bigger, maybe a little smaller. They grow at fairly different rates. Uh, ready to go right now, I just haven't posted them. I've been meaning to, it's been, it's been busy. I haven't even had time to shave or cut my hair, but I'll put a note here to post those in case you want them. Albino quarries. Yeah, so I've got a good group of them right now. I just have to find the time to list them. Um, how are yours doing? Weren't you breeding panda quarries? Was that last week that you had a spawn? Did those go okay? Did the eggs hatch? Where are you at on that, if I'm remembering that right? Dolly Virgil, Dan's I want to cry. Santa was not nice to me with the thread fin. Oh, no. So, Dolly... Oh, the females. Yes. So... Dolly was very excited because I had three female Threadfin rainbows. Um, I have like about 400 Threadfins right now, and I thought there was three females in there. And so I've been keeping an eye on them, and I checked a few days ago, and I was like, oh man, those females are starting to develop threads. So I think that they're actually just slow developing males. So <laughs> I'm so sorry, Dolly. <laughs> That's, oh... Oh, man, I'm sorry about that. Um, now, I'll make you this promise. Occasionally, and it's very occasionally, a supplier will list thread fins and specifically state males and females. If that happens and I'm placing an order, then I'll get some of those and I'll let you know. Because um, you're right, it's difficult to find females. Again, Dolly, I, I apologize for that. I really thought they were females. They had the rounded edges and everything. But now that I look at them, they're starting to elongate a little bit. So I think they're actually sleeper males. Multi-Take Addiction, sub to you. Looking forward to your content. Cool, Multi-Take Addiction. Glad you're here. Thanks for the sub. Howdy, howdy, and welcome over. Um, let's see here. Looking for more highlighted at Dan's Fish comments. That's how we do it here. So if you're new, make your question or comment at Dan's Fish. It'll highlight, it'll jump right to it. So we just miss all the chit chat. Fish Guru Aquatics. I tried green water mulm, infusoria, microworms. It might have been a temperature issue. Okay, so we're, we're talking about breeding SAEs, um, Siamese algae eaters. Um, Fish Guru Aquatics spawned them and got them through the up to about a week or so, but then couldn't keep them going. So we're just trying to figure if green water would work or how you would do that. Yeah, grunge fish can be hard. Like fish that eat grunge, uh, they can be they can be challenging. I, I think Fifty Four Punchies found that out with like the Farowellas. I mean, she's I think you cracked the code, right, Pam? But it's hard to figure it out. It takes there's always something new to try and learn. Keeps it interesting. EJ fishes seventy six at Dance Fish. I've been able to sex successfully breed my bushy nose plecos many times. However, I'm really having trouble getting the fry to survive. Any tips? Um, well, a question. Is it through multiple generations? And are you always selecting brothers and sisters and breeding them to each other? If you're talking about I've been breeding this strain for years and now they're not fertile or they're not surviving, it, it could be an inbreeding issue. Um, if it's not that, if you know that they aren't like inbreeding so much that you maybe need to put new blood in there and you haven't changed anything, th then I wouldn't have a clue. I think most people fail with bushy nose because they just underestimate how much those fish eat. Um, I, I'm not a big pleco guy. I haven't kept them in my private collection once. I just have one kind right now. But I have bred lots of bushy nose um, when I worked for a fish breeding facility and we would put them in a tank, put in a broken flower pot, sometimes not even that, and they would just spawn like crazy. And the key was 
to just have food in front of them all the time. And of course, along with that is then you have to keep the water clean because there's creating a lot of waste. But I assume you're already familiar with that. So I'm sorry, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know beyond like it's just an old strain that now needs some new blood to be crossed in. Um, if everything else is the same, that's that's hard to figure. Fish Guru Aquatics, do you think the baby SAEs need a cool period? I don't know. I don't know. Um, from what I understand, they they can take it cooler. But I mean, it's not like I mean they have a fairly broad range. It's not like it's really cold throughout their range, right? Does does someone know this better than me? Um, what I'm thinking is, okay, I haven't looked at their range in a while, but Siamese algae eaters, Siam, so that's Thailand. There's not a lot in Thailand that isn't pretty warm, so I don't know. But I have to, I'd have to look. If they extend way up into China, and if the source is from China, then maybe they could use a cool-down period. But I don't think the babies would. I think that would be more of a thing to induce, if they needed it, which I don't think they do, to induce the parents to spawn. But if the parents are spawning, usually that means that the temperature is correct for the babies. So I wouldn't think so, fish guru. If anyone here has had success breeding and raising um, Siamese algae eaters, we're, we've had some questions about that. We're trying to help some people out. And I never have. So if you have and you have some secrets, we're all ears. Jeff Chambers, yeah, that sounds about right. I picked up... 125 for them too. I'd say it's a little early to set up, but I'm stoked to have a huge school of them. Yeah, 125 gallon aquarium full of Melanotania parva, the parva rainbow fish or dwarf rainbow fish maybe, three, four inches or so. Yeah, that sounds splendid. In fact, let's be honest, any rainbow fish, a big group of them in a 125 gallon tank is gonna be spectacular. Um, yeah. Even like the simple Trifoschiata rainbows, you'll be amazed once they grow up and fully mature at how just beautiful those guys are. Mob Guppy Night, everyone. Thanks for another great stream. You're welcome, Mob. Thanks for coming by, and we'll catch you next time. Fancy Tail Aquatics, you missed me? Oh, uh, did I? Sorry. Um, oh, I see it here. Fancy Tail, did you make it at Dan's Fish? So if you start typing at symbol and then dance fish, it'll populate, select it, and then it'll highlight for me, and I probably won't miss you. If I did, I'm sorry. Anyone know a good place for hornwort? I ordered some off eBay last year and got dragonfly and mayfly larvae in it. Of course, one of them tried to kill the fish. Um, well, let's see. Let's transition here and see if there's any here. I, I wanted to show everyone real quick these amazing fish that Slippery Fish Aquatics has on Get Gills. They're Crackit on Lateralis. They're just a beautiful Goodyid. I saw a whole bunch of them at Greg Sage's house. He's got a whole bunch of them and they're absolutely spectacular. They're hard to find. When people do get them, they tend to hoard them and they're rarely available. So there are four available right now, just to put it out there, um, at Slippery Fish Aquatics on Get Gills. So. Just think that's kind of a special item that's worth mentioning. Let's see if there's hornwort here. So, um, there has been. Guppy grass would work well for you. Um, nope, don't see any hornwort. So, nope, not at this time. Um, does anyone here have any hornwort that they could sell to, um, uh, who was it again? I'm sorry. Uh, to Fancy Tail Aquatics? Let us know. And so here's a trick, Fancy Tail. When you get the hornwort in, don't put it in your aquarium right away. Put it in another aquarium and put like a, some kind of dewormer in there. You can use Panicure. Uh, which I believe is fenbendazole, which you can find at any like livestock supply store. Um, put some of that in there, and that will likely help take care of any dragonfly larvae and stuff like that. Now, um, 
I do that routinely, and I've never had dragonfly or mayfly larva. I'm not sure that 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 I it ever did have it and that that killed it or not. But that's just a step you can go through to kind of to kind of help. It it definitely helps take care of hydra. That's why I do it. I don't want hydra in my tanks because then my fryer toast. Bob Kaler's Fish Hobby, $25 super chat. Wow, thanks, Bob. Thanks for all you do for us in the hobby, Dan. Thanks again for the Christmas gift. Hey, Bob, thank you. Uh, thanks for being around. It's always glad to have you here. And thanks for being a longtime subscriber and being a reliable member of this community. I'm glad to have you here. All right. Um, so where were we at? We picked up Fancy Tail Aquatics, even though it didn't highlight. I saw it. Um... <laughs> Dolly Vigil. Okay, who ate my shrimp? Ember Tetras, Bushy Nose Plecos, Threadfin Rainbow, Pygmy Cory, or Endlers. Well, Dolly, if the shrimp molted and didn't have anywhere to hide or wasn't smart enough to go hide during the molt, any of them could have done it. I've seen quarter-inch fry tear apart a shrimp, a cherry shrimp, that had just molted. So... None of those strike me as shrimp eaters. In, but, again, if the shrimp molted and wasn't able to get away, then they would be shrimp eaters. So, I don't know your aquarium, but if you don't have a big bunch of plants or secure hideaway place for your shrimp to go while they molt, that might be worth looking into. Um, other than that... Let's see here. Let's say that didn't happen. Ember Tetras, Bushy Nose Plecos, Threadfin. Yeah, no, none of those are shrimp eaters. You know, another thing is if the shrimp died, then they're all going to mob it too. So that could be the scenario. But in my experience, unless you're talking about baby shrimp, if you're talking about baby newborn shrimp, any of those would have done it. Um, it's amazing, like a peaceful threadfin rainbow doesn't bother anything. And then there's a spawn of baby shrimp released, and man, they're picking them off the glass like crazy. That's like their, it's almost like that's their natural food, and they're just cued into it. Same with uh, a lot of the little guys, like the Dario. Dario's do that, CPDs do that, all those little micro predators. So, Dolly, those are my guesses. Maybe someone else has a better idea. Let's play Clue. Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick. Um, Donnie. Thought about Amazon Puffer's beaks. I already clipped one guy. Ooh, but the teeth are growing even faster. Mine eat snails and all that stuff. Even friggin' fish pellets. Ideas? Do you feed them mostly snails? I, I mean, I don't have any ideas. No. It sounds like you're feeding snails. The only thing I could say is... Maybe they need more snails. Or if they're large puffers and they're, they're big enough to eat something up, else what, maybe a different kind of snail that's more of a challenge. Um, I don't know. Sounds like you're already doing it, though. Yeah, my, my only guess is that maybe the snails just, if they're ram's horn or pond snails and they kind of have a brittle shell... Uh, maybe he needs something tougher to chew on. So what would that be? I mean, is there... Can you get a bunch of... Are nerites even a thing that they could do? I don't know. There's many different kinds of nerites. I'm not sure, but I guess my gut instinct is see if there's a snail you can get a hold of that they can handle but that has a tougher shell. Maybe that would help. Or maybe just feed snails more often and cut out some of the... and not the other stuff as often. Um, there... On Corey's video um, from Aquarium Co-op of the Amazon Puffer, he does say that there are reports that some puffers will like nip at rocks and things to help trim their teeth. Um, he says he's never seen it, but he's heard of it. So it might be worth putting some kind of maybe like coral in there. Um, you know how you can go at the pet store and buy like a thing of, I don't know what it's called, dried out staghorn coral or something. I usually shy away from that because it's rough and I don't want it, the fish to scrape themselves in it, on it, but it might be worth putting some of that in there and seeing if he just happens to chew on it or maybe some, sh I don't know, something like that. Those are my only thoughts and they're not good ones, I'm sorry. 
Anyone else know? Anyone have problems with their Amazon Puffer if they feed snails frequently? Um, I don't know if Priscilla's in here. She might have some ideas. But I don't think she's having a problem with their beaks. So, yeah. Lumpy Dog. And all happy holidays. Tell your loved ones that you love them and be nice to people. Cheers. Yeah, for sure. For sure, Lumpy Dog. Will do. Um, Fish Guru Aquatics, I figured the monsoons would drop the water temperature for a couple weeks at Dan's Fish. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, you might be right. Um, yeah, I mean, it could be worth a try, right? <laughs> if you try it without that and it's not working, then try it with it. See if that's the thing. I'm not sure, Thomas, but it could be worth trying. Chef Hannibal just got home and checked on the fish. All are well. Thanks again. Hey, you're welcome. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. <laughs> it's been interesting this week with all the tracking snafus. Like, the postal systems tracking just plain is not working this week. It is full of misinformation. <laughs> it's like from the moment I dropped off the packages, it said they were somewhere else than where I dropped them off. It was weird. <laughs> Thanks again, Bob, for the super chat. For those wondering where I'm at, I just got to Bob's super chat, and now I'm going to Tristan. Are you planning on breeding and selling the albino cauliflower hyphen swordtails? An awesome content. Love your vids. So, Tristan, um, I'm playing with the idea. I kept a few back uh, to see in case I wanted to. I do want to. Here's the problem I'm running into is... I already have a massive project for Santa Maria Endlers going. That's been going for a year, and I can't give that up. And that takes at least four aquariums, and pretty soon it's turning into seven. Um, I've got my better Ruber breeding. I've got several Killies breeding. I really want to do the Swordtails, but I don't want to like abandon my other projects to make room for them. So I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. The other thing is, is this turns into kind of more and more of a business for me, then I have to think, okay, do I need to give up this hobby breeding tank to put stock in so that this can, you know, be a better business for me? So I'm constantly struggling between, I'll never give up the hobbyist completely. I'll always be breeding something um, just because I want to stay in touch with it and because that's what I enjoy the most with this hobby. I like that and I like people getting fish that are healthy and happy and being like delighted uh, by that and, and maybe getting something that they couldn't have got any other way. Those are the two things that I really like. But breeding and raising fish above all is what got me into this, got me hooked and, and has kept me sustained in this hobby for, well, since I was like 13, 14 years old, since 1997, I believe. No, 1992. I can't remember. <laughs> since seventh grade let's put it that way um so um yeah so i held some back because i really like them but a ton of people have contacted me and said like hey i really wanted those um can you get more in stuff like that so i don't know i don't know how if i'll hold on to them or go ahead and be like, hey, this is a business. A lot of my clients want them and go ahead and sell them off. I haven't decided, Tristan. But I am going to try to get more um, come the new year. So there's also, I'm probably not going to get it, but there's also a, a similar sword tail that's a balloon type. I tend to shy away from that stuff. But if enough people wanted them, then I would get them for them. But um, I kind of like the, the one I got better. So, sorry, that's not a uh, great answer, Tristan, because I, I don't know the answer. I'm constantly walking that fence of, this is cool, I want to keep it, versus this is a business. <laughs> and so, here's what the business is. is It's like a restaurant, right? If you have 10 tables at your restaurant, and you serve dinner, and all the tables are full, that's great. But if everyone stays there through the entire dinner service, let's say each table seats five people, then you only served 50 people. And that's as much profit as you can make. But if you can serve those people 
and they get up and go on their merry way and you clear the table and another group comes in and sits down and then you turn the tables now suddenly you fed a hundred people and your profit margin doubled that's kind of what it is like with tank space for me if I have a tank being used in a breeding project I'm not able to turn that table I can sell the fish that are raised from it but that's a lot less volume of a turnover than I could do if I bring fish in and sell them. So I'm already kind of um, limiting that because I hold all my fish for at least two weeks before I sell them. And so I don't turn the tables as fast as most businesses do just because quality is super important to me. And it takes me a week just to get the fish through their medicine that I, I just insist they go through. And then it takes another week before I am like, okay, they've been off medicine for several days now. They're acting normal. Um, they've recovered from their shipping and from their treatment. And now I feel like, yes, I can sell them and know that the person that's getting them is going to have the best chance of success. So since I've already kind of, I've already limited how frequently I can turn the tables. And so that's, that's kind of the thing in my business is, do I turn the table or do I keep these because I love them? So anyway, I bleh, got to <laughs> talked about that enough, I think. But that's kind of the struggle that I'm constantly dealing with. Hello, Dan's Fish Room. Happy holidays to the fish community. Once again, for those who didn't hear, Slippery Fish has these um, amazing Crackadon lateralis for sale right here. You're not going to find them very often. And so just to put it out there there's four of them left they went fast so check them out um and happy holidays to you slippery fish ringatui i get a little bit hungry every time i say your name i'm like ratatui um <laughs> dance fish have you ever used panicure yes to treat internal parasites on fish no if so what process did you use specifically time between treatments etc i already have the dosage sorted i haven't um I use it on plants to quarantine plants. What is going on? Sorry, I didn't transition. <laughs> That's a little better. So I use it to, um, that was like the infinite loop. <laughs> um, yeah, I use it on plants just to kill hydra before I get them into my system. I've used it on reptiles. I used to keep and breed lots of kinds of reptiles and, um, Mountain horn lizards especially would come in just full of parasites and icky and gross and sick and Panicure would just help them so much. But I've never used it on fish because I found between um, Prazi, Quentinol, Metronidazole, and Levamazole, um, that kind of takes care of things. I've never gone through those and been like, man, this fish is still sick. What else could I try? Or, I, or then I would do um, Panicure, which is Fenbendazole or Flubendazole. I can't remember which one. I think it's Fenbendazole, and I think Flubendazole is the same thing in liquid form. Don't quote me on that, but something like that. So I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I've never used that as a protocol. Uh, Ringatui, let me show you this, though. I've shared this before, but I think it's worth sharing again. This website has great information on medicines. So Ringatui, if you haven't been there before, I'll link this in the chat for you. Check this out, and I'm sure that they will have information on Panicure, but just be aware that they might call it um, Fenbendazole or Flubendazole instead of Panicure, because Panicure is a brand name, like Kleenex to tissue, Panicure to, to whichever one it is, Flu or Fen, I can't remember. Mile High Plecos, your computer is on drugs, lol. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat, Mile High. And it was. It was going in, inf in an infinite mind loop. Sorry about that. Um, but hey, Mile High, glad you could be here. So how is Sunny Gillette treating you? Land of uh, palm trees and paradise. <laughs> Hope you're out of there, man. <laughs> if not, my condolences. And the invitation's still open. You're only an hour and a half from me if you're there, so you're always welcome to come over if you want to. Bob Kaler's Fish Hobby. Zach has a great video on his Fahaka this week. Would work for Amazons too. Giant apple snails do the trick. Hard shell. Cool. 
So there you go. Um, check that video out. And do you think, Bob, that giant apple snails would... If a haka could take them, do you think an Amazon could take them, though? Because those things top out at about four inches. Um, so I'm not sure. Zach, the crazy aquarium guy. Cool. Well, check that out. That might have good information on it. And if apples, if giant apples are too big for an Amazon, there's got to be another species that, that's right. The right size and hardness. <laughs> Donnie! Ever bred Corridors Hestatus? Any tips on breeding them? I tried last summer in the pond and got nothing. Got hundreds of CPDs, though. Thanks again for the answers, man. Um, I've bred them, but I've never done the thing where I, like, took them and, like, tried to breed them and raise a bunch. The way they bred for me was just they were in a planted aquarium and occasionally a baby would appear. That's my only breeding experience with them. That being said, I believe Mark's Aquatics has a good video on them. Um, let me see here. And for those that don't know, Mark's Aquatics is a great channel. Um, a gentleman from across the pond. And he does these amazing videos on breeding fish in a simple way. So here they are, pygmy quarries. So I can't, I can't play it, but here you go. Mark's Aquatics has this how to breed pygmy quarries. Um, I'm not sure which species he has, if they're Histatus or Pygmaeus or Habrosus, but um, they're all going to be roughly the same. So I'd recommend checking that video out. Mark's Aquatics, uh, I've been real impressed with the guy's content, especially when it comes to breeding fish. So, Donnie, that's my best, uh, yeah, my best uh, advice for you. Because for me, it was just like they were in a tank and occasionally something would happen. All right. Thomas Skipper, are you going to get more liar tail swords? Yeah. Um, so, Thomas, I plan to do that, provided they're still available, um, after the new year. So, it's going to be mid-January at least before they're ready to go, provided I can get them in early January. But I'm not going to try to get anything in until after New Year's, just because things get too crazy with shipping gets delayed and airports go nuts and yeah, all that stuff. But I, I hope to. I hope to. If by liar tales, if so, liar tales. No, I'm sorry. I'm probably not going to get in more liar tales, but I'm going to get in more cauliflower swords. So red eye red cauliflower hyphen swords. Those kind of albino reds with the massive dorsal fins. That's what I'm talking about. Sorry. Liar tails. Um, maybe if I found a real nice strain somewhere. But I got liar tails in um, on accident. I ordered my favorite platies in the world and they sent me those instead. And I swear I had them for a year. And I still only sold like a dozen out of a hundred or so. So just a general liar tail sword wasn't a good seller. So I won't be getting that again. If I find though a breeder with a really good strain then I might bring that in. So, Blackwater, would you be able to find, let's see here, Laticara dorsigiera. So this would be a cichlid, I'm guessing, but I could be wrong. Let's see. Let's see if I'm right. Yeah. Um, oh, the red breasted car. So here's the issue. That's a cool fish. So here's the fish we're talking about. Um, Red breast Akara, check that out. That's a pretty fish. The issue I have with ordering the Akaras is that they aren't by scientific name. So, oh, <laughs> so it's hard to know if that's what I would get or not. So I tend to hold off on ordering stuff unless I'm more or less sure of what it could be. I might occasionally, every now and then, be like, well, let's just try this um, and get it. But so every now and then there's an Akara available, but it's usually called like, um, I don't know, Red Tail Akara or, I mean, Blue Akaras are ubiquitous. You can always get those. But they just come up with these names that I've never heard before and I can't really guarantee will be the right fish. So I tend not to get those. If I ever. If I ever found an Akara with a scientific name or with, there was, besides a blue Akara, 
that I knew what it was, I would probably get it just because I like them and I think they would do well. But I'm small. Oh, was that when it was going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's the issue is just everything's misidentified. So I'm going to bring this up. This is a good time for this. You got to give your fish stores a little break, okay? We're fish nerds, so we're all like, I want this specific fish, and it's important to be pure and all that, right? That's not how the rest of the world works. Most of this world is like, I want a tank with pretty fish, maybe some plants, and I want them to be beautiful and get along and swim around so after a hard day's work, I can sit down in front of my one tank that I have in my living room and just, just relax and watch them. And when I have dinner company over, we can talk about the fish tank, and it'll be great. Like, that's most people. Most fish stores are selling to most people. So they aren't so concerned about pure strains. They aren't so concerned about um, knowing exactly the scientific name or this population versus that population and all that. They're selling to people who just want pretty fish, and they want them to get along and look good in their tanks, right? So that's the fish store. Their suppliers are supplying the stores, and so kind of how the industry is um, more or less biased is towards suppliers who just make up names that sound good to sell a fish. So there's lots of fish that are called red something. And you get the fish and you're like, there is no red on here. There's a little bit of orange on it. So I guess that justified calling it a red something, right? So the suppliers come up with these uh, names that they think will make the fish sound good so it'll sell well. But one supplier might call it one thing and another supplier might call it something else. And so it's really a crapshoot when you're ordering fish. So the fish stores, when they get something and it comes in mislabeled, it's probably because they're calling it what their supplier called it. And the supplier doesn't know what it is or knows what it is and is just making up a name to try to get it to sell more. And so um, that's, that's, I think, what's typical of the industry. So it makes it really hard sometimes to get, unless you're, no, even then, even if you're getting them directly from the collector, the collector often still misidentifies things. It's just, it's just hard. Mile High Plug goes, F this place, says Mile High Plug with Gillette. <laughs> Who's to Gillette? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. <laughs> Gillette's an amazing place. All right. <laughs> well, if you can, Mile High, if you can get out of there for a few hours, come on over, man. I'd love to have you. Ringatui, thank you. I will check the site you linked. Happy holidays. Well, you're welcome, and I hope it helps. Um, it's been a pretty good site for me. Fish Guru Aquatics, instead of bigger snails, try tougher snails like MTS rabbit snails or nerites. If you have acidic water, acidic water bladder, ramps, horns are nothing. Yeah, that's, that's my water. The shells are so soft because... They don't calcify very well. Hey, SLC Aquatics, welcome. You're almost a neighbor. You're close enough. You're like a neighbor. So welcome, Susan. In fact, one I get down to Salt Lake City every now and then. Next time I'm down there, Susan, maybe we could meet up. That will be fun. Don Gallagher, what is your favorite platy in the world? Oh, it's easy. I can show it to you. Um, I don't know if you're being a shill right now and just like giving me an excuse to do this or if you're asking innocently, but this is my favorite platy in the world. It is this, without a doubt. I love these guys. These are neon yellow calico platies, and I like them because they shine from across the room. They are just absolutely phenomenally gorgeous. Um, so that's my favorite platy. I suppose there might be some wild type platy that's a pure strain that, that I like better, but as far as like domestic type platies, your normal platies, that's my favorite strain of platy. Neon yellow calico platy. They are amazing. And the reason I like them is platies, you know, it's like, okay, I've seen platies. I don't need to see any more platies. And then I was working at a very large wholesaler and walking by the library section one time. And this thing caught my eye. And I looked and I was like, I was like 30 feet away. And I glanced and I was like, what is that? And I walked up to the tank and it was these guys. Just, they, they are iridescent and shiny and amazing. So, Don Gallagher, that's my favorite platy in the world. 
Dolly Vigil, love the thumbnail, by the way, thanks. I was like, we gotta make this fun. <laughs> and, and that's how I felt, too. After a couple days of tracking shipments and just being like, man, I hope they get there. Man, I hope they get there. <laughs> Abode Gold 3765 is the emoji king or queen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's that's a lot. That's a lot of emojis there. How many like underwater aquatic emojis can you find? Several. <laughs> Wichita says, "Time for bed. Merry Christmas everyone. I hope everyone has a safe holiday season. May you have fish and or a fish tank under the tree." From Wichita Falls Fish Keeper. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And it is time for bed. So, this is the time of the live stream where I say um I'm going to shut it down in a few minutes. If you have a question or a comment that it's important to you that it get uh, dealt with tonight, then go ahead and put it down there. Make it at Dance Fish. I'll see it. I'll respond. Do those. And then when we're done those, I'm going to shut her down. Um, and uh, yeah, so we got one here. Don Gallagher, I asked because you mentioned you got your favorite platy. My wife has a 40-gallon platy tank. Cool. Well, thanks for asking. It was a great chance for me to show off my favorite platy in the world. And um, I have a video on them, so I think, oh wait, I lie. I don't think, I don't think I, do I have a video on them? I'll check that. I might have a video on them. I can't remember. But yeah, uh, Don, they really are fantastic. They're, they're worth looking at. Um, okay, that's it for tonight. Happy holiday. Oh wait, got another one. Jeff Chambers. Hey, can you talk about those Rainbow Goodyeads? They like low temps. So, if by rainbow goodyids you mean the Krakadon lateralis, I can't because I've never kept them. But the breeder of those fish um, is in the chat or was recently. So, Slippery Fish, if you're still here, what can you tell us about them? Yes, I know they like lo lower temps. So, I, low 70s, high 60s would probably be great for them. Um, I remember that from when I was at Greg Sage's house and he was showing me them and talking about them. In fact, there's a resource. Go he if you haven't already. Um, I believe, I believe Greg has a video on them, uh, doesn't he? So check out selectaquatics.com. He'll have information on them there. If I think he's also made a video on them, if I'm not mistaken. Select Aquatics or Greg Sage has a YouTube channel and he's got some information. Um, so I think, Jeff, that would be better than me because I've never kept that fish. Uh, Slippery Fish is the one that has those for sale. Those aren't my fish for sale on that site. So for those that don't know, Get Gills, um, there's lots of people that sell fish on it. So anyone can set up a store there and list their fish for sale on there. So my store there is called Dan's Fish. If you go to dansfish.com, it'll take you to that store. But there's also many, many other stores there and many other vendors. So... Um, just because it's on that site doesn't mean it's my fish specifically. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, John Deerer says, when and what are you getting in next? So I won't know for sure until uh, the new year comes and I see exactly what's available. But um, more of those cauliflower sore tails for sure. They sold super quick and a lot of people were like, hey, I wanted those. So I'll get some more in for those that missed out. <coughs> um I'm still trying to get Pseudomulgil fricatus, uh, Pseudomulgil signifer, um, and maybe some female threadfin rainbows for Dolly. <laughs> um, so a couple things like that. But I, I don't, oh, longfin paleotis quarries, because there's some folks that have asked for those. But um, I kind of play it by ear. I'll have to see what's available before I know exactly what I'm getting. Yeah. All right. Um, Let's see here. Andrew Pirokowski on YouTube has also posted videos on Krakadon. Okay, good. Thank you. Good to know, Bathy Philia. Phila. Uh, Grace Steam. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, Don. Um, hey, pal Joey's here. Hey, pal Joey. If I missed you, it's because it didn't highlight. I'm so sorry. And it looks, guys, it, it looks like it's because you put a space between at and dance fish. Sorry I didn't see you. Didn't mean to ignore you. Um, at Dance Fish, 
Now I feel slighted. You're ignoring your elders. <laughs> Using Malachite Green for Dragonfly Larvae, Hydra, etc. kills them dead. Good to know. I didn't know that. So Malachite Green, you can find that in most Ick medicines. Um, so I believe, yeah, it's definitely in, in Ick X, in other Ick medicines. So good to know. Again, pal Joey, that wasn't on purpose at all, man. I'm so sorry. I, it just didn't highlight for me. So let's see here. Um, thanks everyone who super chatted. Thanks to my mods. Thanks to everyone who commented, asked questions. Anyone that helped anyone that had a question or needed, was wondering about some things. And all you lurkers out there, I'm with you. I hear you. I'm a lurker too. Have a great holiday all. And uh, good night. I'll see you next Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time. Until then, oh, I have an unboxing coming out tomorrow that's pretty cool. And um, Empire Gudgeons are part of it and they're pretty fantastic fish so that's worth checking out all right good night everybody have a good one bye